Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless the soul with me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. It's time for us to begin the services of the memorial and the celebration of the life of James Bill Williams. Before our invitation, let me ask that, because this is a time of worship, in which we turn our grief and we renew our hope. And our God through Jesus Christ. We want this service to be reverent. We want it to be respectful of this family, sacred to the memory of James. So please uh, let us assist each other in that. If you have a cell phone or other noise-making device, please be sure that it's on silent. Uh, that's more than appropriate. So let's do that now at this time, please. Thank you so very much. Join me now for the invitation. Eternal God, our Father, we're so grateful to you for who you are to us. Thank you for your love that comes to us without limits. Thank you, O oh God, for your mercy that comes to us without measure. Thank you for your grace that is so generous and so extravagant in our lives. You're reliable. You're dependable. You are faithful. Your promises are sure. Your word encourages us, it comforts us, it consoles us. And so our Father, as we gather now for this service today, we turn our faith, we turn our hope toward you through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask now that you envelop each and every one of us, especially this family, in your loving and eternal arms. Strengthen us, comfort us, console us, support us. We ask for God that in everything that we say and everything that we do in this service today. First and foremost, it will bring glory to you and may it bring strength and encouragement to all of us who gather today. Help us, O God, to worship you Help us to renew our hope. Help us to renew our faith in you. Remind us, our Father, that you're always with us. You never leave us. You never, ever forsake us. And so now, Father, speak to us now. Lift us as only you can lift us. Love us as only you can love us. Bless us as only you can bless us. May it all be now for our good and in your glory. We ask this in the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the people say, Amen. Next on our order is a solo by Brother Greg Diggs. We see the blessing the Lord has for us coming from him. Pray for him as he comes to his ministry. Amen.
when the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. <clears throat> the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord, and the people say, Thanks be to God. Amen. We share now together in the silent reading of the obituary as we had it printed. People said, Amen. Tremendous family, a very beautiful tribute, a very beautiful program they put together. I'm honored to be a part of it. We continue our worship now to come with them. It's coming to bless us with a selection, and I will come and share the message of the Lord has given us for this time. Please receive those coming blessings. I say, Amen. Amen.
two or three in the middle of the block. In that generation, there was only one house of God. That was the temple that was located in the city of Jerusalem. And people did not have the opportunity to go to the house of the Lord with real frequency, with real regularity. They didn't go every week like we do. They didn't go every few weeks like some do. But they went just a few times of the year. And people were scattered throughout Jerusalem, they were scattered throughout Israel, and some were scattered into other countries. Some lived, in fact, hundreds of miles away. But they had what they called pilgrim feasts, certain worship events during the worship year. All of the Jewish families were required to make what they called the pilgrimage, the journey back to the city of Jerusalem. And they traveled some from even hundreds and hundreds of miles. And they did that in caravans with their families. Sometimes that took a few days, sometimes that took several weeks. They did that several times a year. And you can imagine when you didn't go to worship just a few times a year, the word went out that one of those pilgrim festivals was about to occur. They got together with their families. They traveled. And they talked and they laughed. And they anticipated what would happen. And they got all excited about the conversation. They got all excited about the time that they would spend with family. And they also got excited about the unique encounter they would have with God, with other worshipers, at whatever festival it was. Because in that event, God would speak to them in a very special and a very unique way. So that whenever they just started talking about going to the Lord's house, even if it were a few days away, even if it were a few weeks away, people got excited. People got filled with joy. And that's why the psalmist can say, I rejoice with those that said to me, it's about time to go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to his house. I was glad when they just mentioned to me, we hadn't started packing our stuff. We weren't in the caravan. We weren't on the journey. We hadn't started the trip. Somebody just mentioned to me that it was about time to go to the Lord's house. And I got glad. I started rejoicing. In my place, in my privilege for more than 20 years, served as pastor to most of this family during that period of time. James has been sick off and on quite a bit. I discovered this about him to visit him, the hospital to talk with him was to engage pretty quickly in a conversation about attending church. And I don't know of any single time, I can't think of one, I tried over the past several days, and I visited him in the hospital, that the conversation didn't quickly turn to church attendance. And he always promised me, Pastor, when I get out, when I get better, I'm coming to church. Now I'm happy to report to you today that unlike some folks that shall remain anonymous to protect the guilty, it's all right. I'm not calling anybody out. When he said it, he meant it. He kept his word. Isn't that a beautiful thing? To say what you mean and to mean what you say. And he got great delight when he would show up in church. He made it his business to wait until he had just a few minutes of chat with me and traffic and he said, I told you I was coming to dinner. <laughs> yeah, brother, you did and I'm grateful that you kept your word. 
kind of a comical thing. Sometimes he would talk to me about coming to church. I remember one of those times pretty recently he was in the hospital and he said, uh, as soon as I get to feeling a little bit better, I'm coming on to church. I said, I'm going to look for you, James. He said, in fact, I'll be there. He named the day. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, you come on, but you'll be up there by yourself. <laughs> because there is no church that day. Now, I might be working in the office, so you come knock on the window. And we'll just talk and we'll chat and we'll have some church just us two. There are a lot of blessings in life. We should not take any of those blessings for granted. It's a blessing to have a family. It's a blessing to be a part of a family. It's a blessing to be a part of a large family. James was. I think there were 11 siblings. Is that right? That's a large family. I'm one of seven, and that's pretty large in my estimation. But it's a blessing to be a part of a family. Most of the time, it's a blessing to be a part of a large family, especially when that family gets along. Now, if you and your family members don't get along, just do the best you can and hope for the best and try to do better. Does that make sense to anybody? Because I'll just remind us, you know, when it is all said and done, no matter what else we have or don't have, family matters the most. People matter the most. Relationships matter the most. Your money can't hold your hands. Your cars and houses and clothes and jewelry can't comfort you. They can't console you. They can't encourage you. They can't wipe tears from your eyes. They can't endure the midnights and the storms and the low valleys through which you've got to go. Can I say it one more time? When all is said and done, people matter the most. Relationships matter the most. Family matters the most. James figured that out. And he figured out and not just blood family, not just biological family, but there's something special about spiritual family. And he knew that connection. He knew the importance of having brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's why coming to church mattered to him. And I'm not going to have that discussion. I'm not going to have that debate. I'm not going to have that argument with anybody. Whatever your approach, whatever your attitude, whatever your mindset about the church might be, that, that's on you. That's between the Lord and you. But I want to suggest that somewhere along your life's journey, under some circumstances, for some reason, you're going to need the church. You're going to need the people of God. And I'll go another step further. Somewhere along the line, under some circumstances, and for some reason, you're going to need a preacher. You may not need this church, but you're going to need a church somewhere. And you may not need this preacher, but you're going to need some preacher for some reason. It's a good thing to have that relationship all along. It's a beautiful thing to have regard for the Lord's house. And it's even more meaningful when the Lord's house becomes your house. And when the Lord's people become your people. I rejoice with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. I got happy just at the thought of going to the Lord's house. There's something unique about the Lord's house. There's something unique. There's something special. There's something one of a kind 
about the Lord's house and about the Lord's people. That's something you find here. You can't find any place else. And only God himself knows how many storms James got through because he came to the Lord's house on a regular basis. Only the Lord knows how he handled illness and how he dealt with some problems in his life. How he navigated some storms because he got to the Lord's house. I believe that. I hope you believe that. And you know what? Maybe, maybe, you ought to just give it a try. Just maybe, you, you ought to give it a try. I've got a lot of confidence in the Lord. What about you? I've got a lot of confidence in what the Lord can do. And not only do I have a lot of confidence in the Lord, I've got a lot of confidence in the Lord's house and in the Lord's people and in fellowship with the Lord. I know that some things that can happen in the midst of God's people <laughs> that just can't and don't and won't happen any place else. I believe in the Lord. I believe in the Lord's house. I believe in the Lord's people. We're just thawing out, right? Amen. The last few days have been kind of springy. Uh, but don't put your overcoats and your long johns away. That big snow and all that ice and all that. And did you see all those airline the flights were canceled. One airline is going to be fighting for survival, they say. People were stranded, some for a few hours, some for a few days, some for several days, some for a week or longer. And it was interesting to see how people responded to that because they were trying to get home. People just wanted to be home. They had places to go. They had people to see somebody drove 2,500 miles trying to get home. One woman was on a Greyhound bus, Charlotte to Nashville, Tennessee for eight hours. She said, I don't want to be on this bus for eight hours. It would have been an hour and 20 minute airline flight, but this is the best I can do. Somebody else, it took them 3,500 miles to get to their destination. Somebody else was on the news and it took them several days, six or seven days, to finally reach their destination. Here's where I'm headed with all that. I don't know where you're going. I don't know what you're trying to get. I don't know what your destination is, but I come to tell you as I finish this afternoon, wherever you're trying to get, if you're trying to get home, the only way for you to get home, the only way for you to reach your destination, the only way for you to have victory, the only way for you to have success, the only way for you to have joy and peace and contentment is to get right with God. It's to know the Lord and to let the Lord lead you and guide you. The only way for you to make it is for the Lord to be in charge of your life. I rejoice with those who said to me, come on, let's go to the Lord's house. Not just for a wedding, not just for a funeral, not just for some special occasion, not just for Easter, not just for Mother's Day. Come on, let's go to the Lord's house. Because there's something special there for me. 
something that's going to make a difference in my life. And it's not just about what you get here. It's not just about what you receive here. You've got something to give to. And the Lord can take that and bless somebody else's life. Come on. Get your blessing. Come on. Be a blessing.